Um, well, what he hasn't testified on the stand. He, he testified on the stand grand jury. Um, I, re- I talked to him after uh, on the phone, basically, when we found out that he had, been, he had testified in the grand jury. He told me uh, that that hadn't happened. But I obviously, you know, don't have him under oath, and he's not, you know, uh, under penalty of perjury talking to me. And, uh, you know, he's since transferred and, you know, got every reason to believe that he wouldn't want to say that in public uh, yet. But, you know, obviously he had grand jury testimony. That's sealed. So, you know, obviously under penalty of, you know, someone going to jail if they were to give that to us. But that's what he told me. He didn't necessarily, we don't know what he told the grand jury, and we don't know what he's going to tell uh, the actual jury when they have a trial in June or July. So uh, we have we we don't know what he thinks about this under you know under oath under penalty of perjury what he would he would say about that then so we're still figuring out whether that's the case and obviously you know to again say this you know he's not a plaintiff in the case there hasn't there hasn't even been a police incident report let alone charges uh, and I don't know how far I don't know if that's going to be you know even talked about uh, in the actual jury trial against uh, against AJ right. Johnson and Michael Williams if it's going to be talked about in this lawsuit or not but. We don't know what he testified uh, in court about that incident. Richard Herman, give me your take on this latest slander of uh, Peyton Manning 20 years later. Right. Jesus Let's focus Christ. on on Peyton Manning. On Peyton Manning here, and, and here's the problem when you when you try to resurrect the facts and circumstances of cases from 20 years ago, and that's why the Bill Cosby thing is such, you know, a very difficult burden if you're going to prosecute a case that's 20 years or 30 years old, because, you know, there's reason for statute of limitations to try to keep the evidence right. fresh, keep it close. And here, you know, there are incidents that took place at the University of Tennessee uh, 20 years ago. Peyton Manning was star quarterback for a Division One you know, uh, Tennessee football team, and uh, there were allegations that he acted in a sexually inappropriate manner with a female staff person there. And, right. uh, yeah, as a result of that, um, she made a complaint, and it was handled by the university, which it didn't have to be handled by the university. She could have gone to the police and done it criminally, but she let the university run its course, and there ultimately was a resolution in that case where the victim agreed. The, the victim agreed not to go to trial, and the victim agreed to get a settlement, and the settlement was put in writing, and it was a confidential settlement, and both sides agreed they would not discuss this case, the facts and circumstances of the case, and she got a hefty payday from the university. Let's fast forward now. Peyton Manning writes a book. In the book, right. he refers to this incident with this person in violation of his settlement agreement. So she now brings a lawsuit against Peyton Manning saying, listen, you, we had a nondisclosure confidentiality agreement. You violated that by discussing and referring to it in your book. In other words, and this person, by the way, got thrown out of the University of Tennessee, had a start her life over again at another university, and when these allegations and this chapter came out in Peyton Manning's book, she got terminated from her current job. So she brings a lawsuit against him, and of course he hires, you know, high power attorneys. Probably got Joey Jackson in there representing him. I don't know who he got, but anyway, <laughs> he uh, they bring the, the the attorneys fire immediately. A motion to dismiss. This is ridiculous, Judge. Dismiss it. Dismiss the case. And the judge says, <laughs> No. I'm not going to dismiss this case. I find there's merit in this case. I see that there is defamation in this case. I see the groundwork for defamation and more. So I'm letting this go forward. And and, and that's where we stand. And if, if you're going to crit- – and this, by the way, this case will be settled, again, confidentially, and she'll make another big payday here because there's no way they're going to allow this to go to trial. But when you're a, when, when you're a victim – and you and you make claims and allegations against someone, and there are allegations only until you go to court and until evidence is taken on it before a jury or a judge. They are only allegations. An indictment is an allegation only. It's a grand jury indictment, but the defense is not at that indictment. The defense attorneys are not there. It's just a prosecutor suggesting to a group of people that a crime was committed, and they and what do you think? We think a crime was committed. What do you think? And, of course, they raised their hands, yes, and there you have an indictment. And that's why they say you could indict a ham sandwich, because it's one-sided. But an indictment is only an allegation. 
And, and in our society, when someone hears that someone's been indicted, immediately they have them guilty. That's just a mindset. You know, it's supposed right. to be innocent until proven guilty. But if you heard that someone or a friend of yours or someone you know or a friend of a friend or someone you hate was indicted, you will say they're done, they're finished, they're convicted. So it's not the case. It's only an allegation. And when you make allegations of especially sexual misconduct or discrimination against you, and you decide, and you're the one that makes that decision, the victim decides to take the payday and a settlement without going to trial, nobody but nobody has heard any evidence in this case. Nobody knows what the different versions are going to be. Nobody knows what the credible evidence is because we didn't right. get to that point. We settled the case. So it's always a lingering you know, argument out there that, well, it maybe didn't go down this way and people settle cases for various reasons, not necessarily because they're guilty or not necessarily because they, you know, they, they have violated a statute or anything. They just do it because they want to end it. They want to stop the bleeding financially, and they want to get a quick, sm- swift end of a potential problem. And so, and that's what happened in this case. Now, that's why Manning will settle it. That's why he knows full well his attorneys will advise him, wow, this judge is not on your side. This judge is going to, go after, is going to allow her to have her day in court, and everything's going to come out now, including the terms of the settlement agreement and why that settlement agreement came into play. And It's going to open up all these wounds. And, boy, I'll tell you, you know, a few months ago, you looked at Peyton Manning and you said, are you kidding me? This guy's like going to be whatever he wants. He's going to be the, in, in a booth doing Monday night football or doing football Papa on Sundays, Jones. or he's going to be a coach somewhere, a head coach, or he's going to be offensive coordinator. I mean, he's brilliant. He knows football better than anybody. And what an impeccable yes. guy. And all of a sudden you get the HGH stories about him where HGH was delivered to his house supposedly for his wife, not him. Okay, I don't know. Maybe it was delivered for his wife, but you know, it doesn't look so hot. Now you got these stories when he was in college of basically, you know, hush money paid to a uh, sexual assault victim uh, done by him. That's not good. And, uh, you know, you got his performance in the Super Bowl, which is maybe the worst performance of a professional quarterback in a Super Bowl in the history of the Super Bowl. And, and I'm not saying that's Probably. sour grapes because I picked uh, Cam and I picked Carolina to win. I still think they're the better team. But on that day, clearly Denver was the better team and the Denver defense was insane and they deserved to win that game. But, uh, look, you know, Peyton Manning's he's taken some hits and uh, I think he's taken too many hits. So it's time for him to announce his career as a player is over, move on with his life, and uh, and and try to you know get a some sort of public relations firm in there to help you know rebuild his reputation, which is taking some hits right now. Really, I, I look at him much differently than I than I ever have in the past. Well, what do you think about the fact that they people were dogging uh, Cam Newton how he responded after the Super Bowl, and this is the only time when this story resurfaced, and uh, this writer Sean King. Uh, everybody is saying that this is definitely motivated by race. Well, look, I, I, you know, it, it may be, it may not be. I don't know. And in, in, in my opinion, Cam Newton is probably the best quarterback in the NFL. Cam Newton. Oh, absolutely. Um, he wanted to win that game, as everyone in Carolina wanted to win it. They fought very hard out there. It was frustrating. You know, they were within a touchdown late in the game, and uh, it fell apart there at the end. But, you know, um, he came up to him after the game. He shook his hand. He gave. It, he put that Cam Newton smile on, and he congratulated him. And that, you know, that there's a lot to be said for that. And it's a lot to be said for when uh, Manning played the Saints in the Super Bowl and left the field before the end of the game and never congratulated Drew Brees or anybody on the Saints team. You don't well, hear you about that. that. You don't hear about Very that. Good. But here, <laughs> yeah, when Cam Newton, you know, Mr. You know, MVP in the National Football League and All-World, you know, with one loss, loses the last game of the season, 
and uh, is heartbroken and gut-wrenching and probably beat up because he got hit a million times and sore physically and emotionally, and what? So he didn't jump up and down and, and put a show on in front of the cameras? You know, he was upset, he was hurt, he was depressed, and if you've never played football, you just don't know what it's like to be in that position. But I think he acted okay. I think he, he congratulated uh, Peyton after the game. He didn't walk off the field. He did his interview after the game, and the interview process was flawed, and I don't blame him for walking off the way he did. That wasn't uh, um, just bad blood or anything. It was just the way they, they set that whole thing up. A, a simultaneous second interview was taking place at the same time, and a Denver player was there bad-mouthing Cam and, and uh, the Panthers. So, you know, he was listening to that while he was doing his interview, and he had enough. And I don't blame him, because I would have walked off, too. So... At the end of the day, well, he has a wonderful look, future. He'll be back. He's got a the Super beautiful Bowl. future. They're going to—I think they're going to be in the Super Bowl and win it next year. And 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 Peyton goes out a winner, and he should go out now. He cannot continue to play physically. He can't throw the ball especially more than twenty now. yards. He's he's, he's got to go. Answer especially. all these questions. Right. If he exactly. uh, does something else, he doesn't have to answer the question. If he goes out into the sunset, uh, if you will. But the uh, fact that the story came out after. Cam was being bashed, a lot of people feel that this was uh, at least Racially a way motivated. Yeah. to deflect well, look, the attention away from Cam and put it look, on Peyton. Well, you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to play the race card, and people play it all the time, and, you know, people come up with excuses and everything under the sun, but I look at him as a player. I don't look at any color on him. I watch him as a player. The man is just, you know, he's 6'5", 245 pounds, who could run through a brick wall, who can throw the ball better than any quarterback I've seen in a long time, who can read defenses. You know, I mean, the guy is just really multi-talented, and, and uh, he's taken a lot of unnecessary heat. I think that people forget he was the National Football League MVP. And, uh, you know, tough loss, tough game, great play by the Broncos, great defense. Great, great defense. Defense wins big games, and uh, every time I lose a Super Bowl like that, I forget that defense wins big games, and it's my fault. But uh, I don't know. Cam was pretty damn good. Yeah. What about Von him? Miller was in, they say he, he reminds people of Lawrence Taylor and he does. I mean he controlled the defense and and you know, you gotta give him the M V P. You gotta give it to him. I mean he was just tremendous. Okay, the uh, new show is, is taking uh, huge ratings. Let's hear a clip from uh, The People versus O.J. Simpson. We'll talk. Right. It's like the world's longest Ford Bronco today. commercial. We are told by the California Highway Patrol that O.J. Simpson is in that car holding a gun to his head. He wants to be taken to his mother. He wants to see her. You can ask every single person who was alive on June 17th, 1994, and they will tell you where they were at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We all know where we were during that chase. It's crazy. I was here in L.A. We had just shot the pilot for Friends, and then we were in that waiting period to see if we were going to get picked up. I had just gotten back from the Cannes Film Festival, where a movie called Pulp Fiction had won Best Picture. I remember exactly where I was. I was at my friend Alicia's house in Brooklyn, and we watched it on the TV. I think I sat there for like five hours going, is it ever going to stop? Is he ever going to get off the highway? It went on and on and on. Is this for real? Like, O.J. Simpson is doing what? I was at a buddy's house. We were watching. We were like, we're about to see a man get shot. We thought for sure he was gonna, they were going to snipe him. I mean, that's just something you never forget. How is O.J. back in his white Bronco? What do you mean? I mean, the Bronco was full of blood. We impounded it. Believe it or not, there are two white Broncos. A.C. Cowlings worships O.J. so much, he bought the identical car. Unbelievable. There is now a statewide manhunt underway for O.J. Simpson in California. You were watching it unfold. You weren't watching the aftermath of something. You were watching it happen. O.J., wherever you are, please surrender immediately to any law enforcement official. We were all glued to the TV because of the spectacle. Well, this series, we go inside the Bronco and we actually experience the emotion that these two men, Al Cowlings and Orenthal, go through. Sir, step out of the vehicle! No, 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 help! 
Oh, no! Sir, you need to turn your engine off and step from the vehicle now! Gotcha. My challenge as a cinematographer was to put the audience in the back seat with OJ and be able to kind of see what he's seeing and feel what he's feeling. <laughs> I think the audience will feel that excitement of those shots too when they see that sequence.